Bible Fellowship. Uh, today is November 3rd, and the title to today's sermon is a question. Can tradition deliver righteousness? You know, what, what do we as Christians require to spend eternity with God? I mean, God came down, He died on the cross, our sins are paid for, is the, the payment of sin the only thing that we need to, to spend eternity with God? Because didn't, he, didn't Christ die for the sins of the world? Yes, He did. So if, if the payment of sin was the only thing that we required to spend uh, being in heaven, wouldn't the whole world be able to go to heaven? I know we're, it's, we're all qualified to go, but wouldn't we all be going? So, like a wise investor, we should spend our time wisely preparing for the afterlife. Because obviously there's something else that we need other than the payment of sin. Many people believe that it is all that, that <laughs> believe that this is all there is. And that after we die, there's nothing more. There is no afterlife, that this is it. And we know that uh, we die and then there's a foretold judgment. What do the scriptures say? Hebrews 9.27 says that, And it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this judgment. So the scriptures tells us that there is something else. There is more. And that we ought to be preparing for that. So how, how do most people seek out perfect righteousness? What do they use to discern what truth is? And what does the word discern mean? And we've all heard that. We need to discern scriptures. We need to discern what truth is. You know, when you when you look at the political environment today, and what is truth? People will sit there and say things, and you're like, you're obviously not telling me the truth. It, 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 it's not lining up with what my eyes are seeing, what my ears are hearing. So what do they use to discern truth? In today's sermon, we're going to examine the different ways that people seek out righteousness and how they decide what path they will follow to get, get to perfect righteousness. Now, if you were to define the word discernment, you might describe it as the, ab the ability to judge well. And just like we were talking about with politics, you listen to the politics, <coughs> The stories that they're telling are are so opposite. They're so far from each other that there's no way that they both could be true. <laughs> they're polar opposites. One's on the total left, one's on the total right. So how are we to judge well? How are we to decide what really is true? Uh, in the Christian circles, we would, we would say that discernment is perception in the absence of judgment with a view to obtaining spiritual guidance and understanding. So we want to be able to look at Scripture and, dis and understand what it means, to, to receive spiritual guidance as to what the interpretations of Scripture are and what they really mean. Now God has given us tools in order to do this. He's given us right division. He's given us a road map telling, him, telling us of the different programs and the different policies that he's had with a different people. So if we don't use right division, then we will not be able to rightly discern scripture. Now, how important is it that we obtain perfect righteousness? As I said, we've got, we've got the payment of sin taken care of. But without perfect righteousness, would we be able to stand in the presence of a holy God? The prophet Isaiah asks an important question in Isaiah 33, 14. He says, the sinners of Zion are afraid. Fearfulness hath surprised the hypocrites. Who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with the everlasting burnings? So what is he saying there? Who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? If you look in Scripture, God is described as a devouring fire. And His holiness will devour that which is not righteous. 
in his presence. Uh, kind of like, you remember the uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego when they were thrown in the furnace that was heated up to seven times its, its normal heat. But because Jesus Christ was there with them in the fire, they were protected. Their, their eyebrows were not even singed. So, so Isaiah is asking, who is going to be able to stand in the presence of an almighty and holy God, perfectly holy God, because his very being, his very presence, cannot be in the presence of unrighteousness. It will just devour it and destroy it. You know, uh, what, so what path will we follow to obtain perfect righteousness? The question is asked, who can stand in that presence of the everlasting burning? So, God is eternal. He is, he is perfectly holy forever. Which is the, what is the illustration of the perfect righteousness and holiness of God? The answer to that question is, is only righteousness. And not, and not only righteousness, but perfect righteousness. Mm -hmm. Where do we get it? How do we obtain it? For the purpose of this discussion, we will, we're going to break the, the masses into three separate groups. Unbelievers, the religious, and the body of Christ. The unbeliever, they lack the acknowledgement of God. They refuse to even acknowledge Him. The fool has said in his heart, there is no, there is no God. Absent God, what are you left with? You're left with philosophy, the wisdom of man. You're left with government. You're left with self-righteousness. These are the things that the unbeliever look to to decide what is right and what path they should follow. If you look at if you look at the different philosophers in the world, and I'm not gonna I'm not gonna detail them, uh, they all seem to look at the the works of man and what man can do. And man is the uh, creator of wisdom. Uh, somebody has lived on this world and they've, they've learned so many different things and they, they pass that wisdom on to others. Have you ever studied the philosophers? Most of it's foolishness. It is. Most of it's foolishness. Most of them were mentally ill in one way or another. Which is scary. And yeah, it is. And they are they are absent absent the presence of God and absent the knowledge and, and the wisdom of God. If you turn to uh, Romans chapter one, we're going to detail verses eighteen through twenty five, where God talks about how man rejects the wisdom of God and the even the the presence of God, and and what it kind of what it causes, and what direction it moves them in. Romans chapter one is actually a very great, very great verse. Amazing. Talks about how God reveals Himself, and that man is without excuse. Um, that that you know you know how they say ignorance ignorance of the law is not an excuse. When you're speeding down the road, some dark road, going 50 miles over the speed limit, and you know that country cop pulls you over, it's usually not going to do uh, too much well. Say, no, I didn't see a, I didn't see a sign. I didn't know how fast I was supposed to be going. Uh, he's still going to hold you responsible and accountable. Okay, so we're all there. So Romans chapter 18 says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. So what that's saying is man has rejected the righteousness of God and he's decided that his own righteousness is acceptable and it is acceptable to live by and actually preferable. Now have you ever heard uh, some of your friends that you've, you've tried to uh, witness to and they say, well, I know that I'm going to hell. You ever have one of those friends? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and they, they were right. Yeah, they said, well, I know I'm going to hell. And, and it's, it's going to be a party because all my friends are going to be there. Okay? All the, all the people who I like hanging around here and like doing the things that I do, they're, they're all going to be there in hell with me. Mm. 
So the man has accepted their unrighteousness and their unholiness and are actually pretty comfortable in it. Kind of like that pig in the pigsty who likes to roll around in the mud and you take that pig out and wash him up and take him to the fair, he's very uncomfortable. <laughs> but the sinner can be like that also. When you, when you remove them out of the sin and you put them in the presence of God, Kind of like turning the lights on the roaches. They like yeah. to scatter. Verse 19 says, Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. And this talks about the fact that God is going to hold them accountable. That they are without excuse. That God has manifested himself in his very creation. There is no, no one has any excuse saying, Well, I didn't know there was a God. I didn't know what God required of me. God has revealed it. God, God sends, sends many things letting us know that there is a God. We used to have a gentleman that used to go to church here. And uh, he used to ask me, he said, does God give the gospel to every single person? And I used to believe that God gave the gospel to every single person. I, I've, I've kind of moved away from that belief. Uh, God manifests himself to every single human being. And he does it through his creation. Mm -hmm. If you're able to look out into this world and the, the magnific magnificence of it, and the magnificence of how we are made, even just, just man, if you're able to look at that and believe that it just popped up out of nowhere, mm -hmm. then you, are, you will not reach what is called God consciousness. You're not gonna you're not gonna come and acknowledge that there is a God. And God is not required to give you any more information after that. I don't believe that he is. Mm -hmm. Now, he he does with some people. We've we've talked about my my friend Eric, who his mother is a, a uh, an evangelist, his brother is a pastor. I've been best friends with him since I was 13. <laughs> I have talked to him much about Scripture and God. And Michael's, Michael's talked to him. Many times. God has given him an overload of information. And we were talking a couple of weeks ago about when the rapture comes, that people like that will not have another opportunity because they've been given the gospel. Right. They've been given the truth. They've been given what was, what, what was required. Now God is going to send them the great deception. Strong delusion. Great delusion. Thank you. Verse 20 says, For the invisible things from Him, from, uh, him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. So that just talks about how magnificent this world is and that God has patterned creation after after Himself. That that you can clearly see the God by the things that are made, by time, by matter, uh, by DNA, by all different things. It's God's fingerprint. You can see. You know, many people are so confused about the Godhead. Like, you know, how can it be three but one? I, I, you know, we you know we all say, well, we don't have anything to compare that to. Actually, you do. You do have things to compare that to. Nothing, nothing will equal it. Nothing will perfectly represent it, but it will steer you in that direction so that you can understand it. Like, as I said, time, how you have past, present, and future. All three, di three different manifestations of time, but one time. Then you have matter, water, solid, gas. Three different manifestations of, of, a so, of a solid like water, but it's only, it's just water, just in different forms, different manifestations. And there's many things throughout creation that testify of God, testify that He is and that He exists and that we are to, that we are to worship and to praise Him. Amen? So... So, 21 says, Because that, when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, 
neither were thankful, but became vain in their imagination, and their foolish hearts were darkened. And that's what happens when, when you move away from God, when you move away from acknowledging God and serving God, there's only one direction that you can go, and that's towards evil. So your heart will be darkened when you're moving away from God. It's kind of like this light here. You can clearly see me in this light, but the further I move away from the light, the less clearly you can see me. And as you move further back, it's the less you can see the light. That's true. So your heart is dark will be darkened. So without God, there is no there is no human good. You know, uh, when you talk to people about uh, God, they often say, "Well, you know, I'm a good person. I'm a decent. I'm a decent person." Well, what are you using that to measure? To measure that by? What is your standard that you're measuring that by? Because God says, "There, outside of God, there is no good. But there is no good thing. The man's heart is evil and wicked." So. When we, we are left only with evil when you're moving away from God. And this is what happened to man as they, in, in the Gentiles. When they, when they refused to worship God, when they refused to acknowledge God, God gave them over and, and allowed them to have what they sought. Yes, he did. They weren't seeking righteousness. They weren't seeking, uh, seeking God. And what they did is verse 22 professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. So man, man started making up alternative stories to God. Alternative stories to how this magnificent world was created. And when you look at it, it's foolishness. Well, the world just came and poofed out of nothing. It just from from a from an explosion, things came together. Every time I've seen an explosion, things have been blown apart and destroyed. <laughs> yes, it, from 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 chaos came order. Which is ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. But fool, but the foolish heart of man believes this because they have to believe this in order to reject God and to reject the teaching and the wisdom of God. So th in things like philosophy, the wisdom of man, a, ph a philosopher is defined as the lover of wisdom. Mm -hmm. The lover of their own wisdom, not the wisdom of God. Psychology is the fixing of the human mind. Mm -hmm. It's actually the tearing down of the human mind. I've, I wor I've worked with many psychiatrists cases. trust me they don't know what they're doing with the meds it's all it's all just get a guessing game <laughs> let's start them on this one and then take them off this one this one doesn't work and let's let's try them on these these ones it, it's it really is a guessing game and what is the other thing that hu hu human the, the unbeliever has depended on to decide what is right for their life they they've decided that government can, can give them the correct path. All you need to do is look at not just our government, but any government around the world right now. They, they, they dwell in foolishness. They dwell in greed, in, de in deceptiveness. Uh, can, can you get a, a politician to tell you an honest answer? Or or try to actually make it better for the people that they serve? No. 99% of them are crooks. Yeah, they are. 23 says, and change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image like, like to corruptible man, and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. So in their rejection of the one true God, they decided to make false gods to worship. Let's, let's make this rock and worship this rock who okay. can give no answer, who, who, can, who cannot hear, who cannot see. It's, it is, it's utter foolishness. 
So instead of worshiping the creator, what they've come down to do is they worship the creation. And in worshiping the creation, what they really are doing are worshiping themselves. 24 says, Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through their lust and of their own hearts, and to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. So finally, God just turns them over. When they, when they reject Him, when they refuse to serve Him, He kind of turns them over and says, Fine, here you go. This is what you want. Basically have at it. Uh, he's, made, he, he's made a path of reconciliation that you refuse to take. And what does man do? Man change, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worship and serve the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. Is this not where we find ourselves today? Yeah. Has lying not become just second nature to, to man? Pe people, people lie so easily now. And as we talked about before, have you have you ever received those phone multiple phone calls from people trying to sell you stuff on your on your phones? I, I get I get about ten or fifteen a day. Now they're now they're texting me. <laughs> okay. You know, uh, buy, buy this car warranty. Not not that a car warranty is a bad thing, but do you think I'm going to buy it from you after you've called me about seven times, seven or eight times? No. Uh, there's so many deceptive things going on now where businesses just, their, their role is to get money out of your pocket. Not to, not to offer you a good product, not to, not to service you, but to get money out of your pocket. This is where we find ourselves when we, when we leave God behind, when we kick God out of the schools and we wonder, why, is it, why, are, why are the kids so difficult in school? Yeah. Why, why don't they want to behave? Why don't they want to, to learn? Uh -huh. But that this is where we find ourselves. Next we're going to look at re the religious people. Because the unbeliever is not even seeking righteousness. No. Mm -hmm. They've rejected God and rejected righteousness. And the only righteousness they seek is their own. But the, but the religious people are a little bit different. Like the Jew, they depend on tradition and the Mosaic law to deliver righteousness. Think of the pious uh, Pharisees, who when, when their Savior came, they chose to have the, tra the tradition instead of grace. Mm. They decided that they liked their position. They liked the traditions that worshipped them. They decided that Grace was not required. Where the, where the Jews were required to keep the law, the modern day saints are free from the law. Yet, they are unable to let go of the acts of the law and declare that they are showing evidence of their faith. Why do people tithe now? Why do people speak in tongues? Why do they get water baptized? Because they think that they are... They think that they are either being saved by it or they're showing evidence of their faith. When you ask somebody uh, about water baptism, what, what's the common answer that you get, at least along in the, in the Baptist church? Well, I'm giving a public confession of an, or an outward expression of an inward reality. I'm making a public confession of my faith. Uh, we live in a time where we're led by grace. And there, there is no need for evidence of our faith. But most Christians today have declared themselves Jews and have inserted themselves into covenants which they are not, they are not intended for them. They're, they seek righteousness by the law. And what does the Bible say? That if you're going to pick up one part of the law, pick up the whole thing. Consider this. The kingdom gospel believers' path to righteousness existed before the cross. The cross wasn't required for their path of righteousness. Their salvation was not associated with Christ's death on the cross or his resurrection. They were required to believe that he was the Messiah. Their corporate acceptance of the Messiah delivered will deliver them perfect righteousness. 
The confusion of the modern day church will leave them without righteousness, the, without the righteousness of Christ, and without a seat in the kingdom. That they are not even part of that program. They're not qualified for it. That's like going waiting outside a show that you don't have a ticket for. <laughs> You're not going to be able to get in. But this is this is where you find most modern day uh, churches seeking after the program of Israel and seeking the blessings of Israel. Last, we have the body of Christ. We have us. The body of Christ is unique, unrevealed from the before the beginning of time, dependent on the cross for forgiveness of sin. Romans six twenty three says, "For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord." They're justified by the death of Christ, raised with Christ in resurrection. And as Ephesians 2 and 8 and 9 says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Quickly turn with me, and then we'll be finished here, to Romans chapter 1, excuse me, Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. This is another uh, one of my favorite pieces of scripture. And this, this is how Paul explains our status in Christ. Where we are. Everybody there? And verse 1 says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was, has, was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Amen. You know, we worry so much, as we should, because we're serving God, that that we're living a life that is pleasing unto the Lord. But we shouldn't stress ourselves out too highly about sin because you know sometimes when you worry too much about something, it drags you right back down into it. Sometimes we need to learn to just say, Lord, you know I want to serve you. Take this from me, please. Amen. Take this from me. But he's already made provision for, for a payment of that sin. He's, he's buried it with Christ and he's raised you with him that now you stand in the righteousness of Christ and you will be presented at that, at that judgment seat holy and perfect and you will be able to withstand the eternal fire, Amen. the burning fire. You will be able to stand in His presence yes, eternally. Mm -hmm. Not by any works or anything that we have done, mm -hmm. but by what Christ did for us yes. on the cross. Dying on the cross in resurrection. Amen. And that is the only way to reach perfect righteousness. Mm -hmm. Amen? Yes. Amen. 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 Uh, Osiris, you want to close up for me today? Sure. Father God, we like to give thanks to bring us all here together to study your word. And thank you for the sermon that was preached today. We pray that we take in that word by faith and apply it to the details of our life. We just like to pray for those that are not here today that you be with them and be with us all throughout the rest of this week. In Jesus' name we pray and thank you. Amen. 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 I got a chair. I'm waiting for the seats of our four.